Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Cat Chats, the podcast about all things weight loss, bariatrics, fasting, and more. My name's Coach Kathy Richardson. I've lost 150 pounds. And speaking of fasting, that was a big part of my journey. And to celebrate that and to encourage all of you on your weight loss and your weight maintenance goals, I'm choosing to start a challenge on February 1st with all of you, my dear listeners and viewers, if you're on YouTube, hello. And it's going to be the Fast February Challenge. And it's pretty simple. We're just going to try intermittent fasting for 29 days consecutively. That's it. That's the challenge. How you do this is going to be up to you. I'm a former hiker, and we always like to say, hike your own hike. And so I say to you today, I want you to fast your own fast. You're in the driver's seat. You're going to determine how this goes, and I'll guide you along the way with a few parameters. So first of all, um, let's just get one thing out of the way though, guys. This isn't a diet. I hate the D word. That's a dirty word here in the catmosphere. And um, really it's kind of ironic because a diet is what you eat and fasting is not eating. So it's really like fasting is the antithesis of dieting. Like it's the complete opposite. It's, it's One's got nothing to do with the other. I'm not gonna say that what you eat when you are eating during your intermittent fasting periods of eating, also known as your eating window, you know, that always matters. You can't outfast a bad diet. I'm not coming on here today and telling you that you can, you know, delay your breakfast by an hour or two in the morning and stop eating at 10 o'clock at night and then eat Snickers the whole time in between. Uh, Snickers, nothing against you. Just saying, you know, maybe we shouldn't have a diet of only Snickers. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, you, you, can't, you gotta use a little bit of common sense here. But my inbox is full of people saying like, Coach Kathy, when I'm fasting, can you do up like a 30-day meal plan for me for when I'm fasting? Or what should I go buy at the grocery store because I'm going to start intermittent fasting? And, you know, there is no set diet to do when you're fasting. Um, that's really not the focus of fasting. Fasting, the focus is more on when you're abstaining and for how long and why and and what you're drinking when you are during those fasting windows so we're just going to go over those few things today but it it is really just as simple as fasting is the absence of eating it's free it's easy and almost anybody can do it so let's get that out of the way right now there are a few of you who fasting is not appropriate for we've touched base on this but if you're new to my channel or new to this podcast right off the bat if you have a history of disordered eating, fasting is not for you. If you're pregnant and nursing, fasting is not for you. And if you're nine months post-op or sooner, if you're anywhere between like you just had surgery today or you're not quite nine months out, I'm not going to recommend that you dip your toe in the world of fasting yet. You know, that's really the time for you to hone in your healthy eating skills. And if you missed my podcast just before this, which was fasting after bariatric surgery, and you are a post-op zero to nine months, I encourage you to go back, check that out, listen to it, and you'll know exactly why this just isn't, just not yet for you, okay? So number two, let's get an, a myth out of the way, and that's fasting is starving yourself. You know, that drives me crazy. As a former teacher, and now as a current weight loss coach, I guess like misinformation, misinformation, disinformation, uh, just rumors. There's there's all kinds of things. It's kind of like when you first find out you're pregnant, everybody under the sun is going to give you all kinds of advice about what you should and shouldn't do when you're pregnant. Well, okay, fasting's like that times like a thousand. <laughs> so I kind of like to joke and say fasting is like fight club. Rule number one of fight club is we don't talk about fight club. So, you know, if you don't have people who are going to be supportive of you on your fasting journey for these next 29 days, just don't talk about it with them. You don't need to convince anybody. Uh, if this is new to you and, and you're just trying to get things figured out, don't feel like you need to be an expert in this and defend why you're doing this. So uh, yeah, let's just get that out of the way. But unfortunately, fasting is kind of the boogeyman of the diet world. And most people who don't know about it, it makes them uncomfortable because they don't know about it. And because they don't know about it, they don't want you doing it. So, you know, always do your own due diligence. I always encourage you to do your own research and uh, I'm not a doctor, I don't play one on TV, I'm not an endocrinologist, I'm not a psychologist, but I do know intermittent fasting has been a huge part of my journey and enough people have asked me to talk about it, so that's what I'm doing, okay. So unfortunately, you know, this uncomfortableness comes because we have become a food-obsessed culture. 
And it's turned us into being obsessed about food to the point where some of us have even made it an addiction and it's making us sick. And you only need to open up a magazine or listen to the radio or watch TV or now even like TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, it's almost all just food, 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 you know, food everywhere. So that's one of the things that I really love about fasting is it's a break from all that. You know, you're kind of pulling back and you're stopping the brakes and it just gives you and your brain a moment to not have food brain all the time. It kind of quiets that down a little bit. And that's probably due to a little bit of um, ghrelin suppression too, which is the I'm hungry hormone. We call it the gremlin gremlin. And, uh, you know, fasting is going to decrease your, your ghrelin throughout times during your fast. So that's awesome. So before we get started, like I said, you need to fast your own fast. And this is where it gets personal for you. This is what I want you to do before you partake in this challenge. The first thing you need to do is decide your why. You're going to have to decide your why. You're going to have to decide your what. And you're going to have to decide your when. This is when and what I love about fasting is that it's very individualized. Your fast probably isn't going to look like my fast. And that's for a bunch of reasons. So let's go over those now. And when I say like your why, what is your goal during these next 29 days? Because based on that, that's going to kind of determine your what, which is what you're going to eat and drink. So if your only goal is just to lose some weight, we can absolutely have that happen during these next 29 days. And if you don't give a flip about any of the sciencey stuff that's going to be another option for your why, then just know that you kind of have it the easiest because you have a little bit more freedom with what you're allowed to have during your fasting window when it pertains to beverages. If you are fasting for weight loss or weight maintenance and you want all of the metabolic benefits of fasting, and you want to experience autophagy and, you know, really do the cellular reset and reap all the benefits of intermittent fasting, then that also is going to change your what, aka what you eat and what you drink during the next 29 days. And that's because there's certain things that are like metabolic disruptors, and that can be like artificial sweeteners. Um, that's pretty much the biggest one. And um, so... I hate the term clean fast and dirty fast. Jen Stevens has written a couple of books and, you know, overall they're pretty good. There's Fast Feast Repeat is her biggest one right now that's out. And she coined the term clean fast and dirty fast. And to her, a clean fast is water, black tea, or green tea only. And that's it. And that's all she encourages her patients and people who follow her fasting parameters to partake in. So, you know, Dr. Jason Fung is another one that I listen to a lot, and Dr. Mindy Pels, and they're a little bit more forgiving on what you can have as far as your beverages. But the most important thing for you to focus on here is everybody across the board says you do need your beverages. During your fasting, which is the time that you're abstaining from eating, you still absolutely need to be getting your fluids in. That's very, very, very important. You need to be drinking water. You need to... Uh, be conscious of what you put in that water. If you're only fasting for weight loss, go ahead and put a squirt of Mio in there if, if you have to have some Mio. You know, it, Rome wasn't built in a day. If you need to do this in baby steps and just restricting your food for a little bit in the morning and night is a big enough of a change that it's just going to seem impossible if you can't have your Mio, I encourage you to have your Mio. And then, you know, gradually we'll work on things getting a little cleaner, as she likes to say. But, um, you know, throw a slice of lemon in that water if you need to. This is also like if you've never, ever, ever had black coffee in your life or coffee without your cream and sugar, maybe let's just try a little bit of cream and, you know, get rid of the sugar. I'm not going to, sugar absolutely is going to break your fast. And so the second that you put sugar into your body, you have now opened your eating window. And so I'm not encouraging that, but maybe if you do need that packet of Splenda or a little drop of monk fruit or something like that in the beginning, even Dr. Fung would say like, that's okay. Use whatever crutches you need to, to get you started. And then every day or every couple of days, you can start to take some of those things away, especially if you're looking for those metabolic benefits specifically. Like if you are only fasting for weight loss purposes, I even heard Dr. Mindy say on Instagram last week, like if you need your can of Diet Coke in the afternoon, you know, whatever. I'm, I'm not judging. I'm not your gatekeeper. And I'm never going to tell you what you can and can't eat as a weight loss coach. But everybody needs your water. 
everybody is probably going to benefit from a little bit of electrolyte. So whether that's putting a little bit of pink Himalayan sea salt under your tongue or taking a swig of dill pickle juice that will not break a fast. It's just water, vinegar, and salt. That's fine. Um, the product element, LMNT, which is an electrolyte supplement, you can go mix up your own or you can buy it from them. There's even electrolyte capsules, things like that. Just they're not going to break a fast and they can be important and they can help reduce cravings. They can help reduce um, leg cramps and different things that some people do experience when they're fasting and mainly because they're keeping you hydrated, which is absolutely always important when you're fasting. So if you've never heard the term fasting windows before, if, if this is like really fasting 101 for you, all that means is, is you're going to have two windows during the day. You're going to have your fasting window, and that is when you're abstaining from all food and anything with calories. And then you're going to have your feasting window, also called your eating window. And that is when you do partake in your food. So this is where you need to decide your what. And so your what is going to be what are you going to eat and what are you going to drink during your eating window specifically. So when you hear me say, okay, you've opened your window now. Now that means that it's the time that you have decided and predetermined that this is when you're going to eat. Most people do what's called a 16 and 8 fasting regime. So that means they are fasting, completely abstaining from food and calories for 16 hours. And that includes when you're sleeping. And then they have a window, meaning they open up their eating time for eight hours. That is the most common one. Is that the best one for long-term weight loss? If you have a significant amount of weight to lose, maybe not, but it's the best place to get started. And if even 16 hours seems too long, you can do 10 and 14. So have like a 14 hour fasting window and a 10 hour eating window. Uh, you could even go down to 12 and 12. And if you need to start for a day or two at 12 and 12, that you just eat from eight in the morning till eight at night. If that's what you're doing in the beginning, go for it. Just get started. Again, you know, it's, it's mercies are renewed every morning we hear in the Bible, you know, so uh, and grace is renewed every morning. So you get to hit the reset button again every morning and you can change your eating hours from one day to another. It's not, if, if you started on 12 and 12 and that seemed too easy, go to 10 and 14 and then maybe go to 16 and eight and then maybe you'll wanna go to 18 and six. So if you've never fasted before, I absolutely would recommend the maximum that you fast for these first couple of days even until you get the hang of it is 16 hours. So you're gonna have a 16 and eight. And again, if you need to do 10 and 14 or 12 and 12, that's okay too. So if you are only fasting for weight loss only, you can, according to Dr. Fung, have a little bit. He's talking like a maximum a tablespoon of heavy cream, not creamer, not international delight, not that pre-sweetened stuff. He's saying if you need a little bit of cream in your coffee for a little while, that's okay. And guys, I'm going to tell you, I've been fasting for four years minus the pause I took after I had my bariatric surgery in 2001 until I was about nine months out. I didn't fast during that time because it wasn't appropriate. And then I did start my fasting regime again right around month like nine or 10. And that whole time, this whole time, I've always put cream in my coffee. I always will put cream in my coffee. It doesn't elicit an insulin response. It has under 50 calories. So he says it doesn't disrupt the metabolic benefits of fasting enough it, it might even like pause autophagy for like an hour and to me that was an that was a give I was willing to sacrifice it has not held me back but you might be different than me we're all more and less metabolically broken than others you know I started this journey extremely insulin resistant and now I don't have insulin resistance at all I can tolerate different things better now than I could before so you do you, fast your own fast. It's up to you what you're going to do when you do this. But um, just make sure, again, you've got the water. And as far as what you're eating, again, just use common sense. If you are, if you love Weight Watchers and you've always done Weight Watchers, and you're always going to do Weight Watchers, but you want to try intermittent fasting, then eat what you would normally eat during Weight Watchers. You know, if you do have a significant amount of weight to lose and you have been eating some low carb, I can absolutely tell you, and I am living proof that combining low carb with intermittent fasting is extremely powerful for losing weight. I'm not telling you you have to go strict keto for this to work. That is not true. Lots of people fast and never do keto for a minute. But if you've listened to some of my previous podcasts and seen some of my previous YouTube videos, you know, we do discuss the effects of insulin on the body and on an obese and morbidly obese and even overweight body. So um, I'm just going to say make smart choices. 
and decide what you're going to eat at the beginning of the day. 4.30 p.m. starving hangry Kathy does not make good food decisions, but 8 a.m. Kathy, who pre-plans what she's going to eat that evening, makes far better choices. So it's just something to think about in the morning, that you set your parameters of when you're going to open your window and what you're going to eat and what you're going to drink. You know, fail to plan, plan to fail. I say that all the time, and that absolutely still applies here. So now for your when, that's going to be your eating window. You're going to predetermine this the night before. You're going to set up your parameters so you're not just willy-nilly guessing. And it just kind of helps to say it out loud or to write it down. I always encourage journaling. You know, we're just finishing our January challenge. And if you are on our Down 150 Pounds with Coach Kathy Facebook group, I've been giving you a journal prompt of the day. And I encourage you to keep doing that. And especially when you're fasting, it's going to be really good to be like, oh, I fasted 16 and 8 today and I wasn't hungry. I'm going to try 18 and 6 tomorrow. Or I really struggled with 16 and 8 today. I think I'm going to go down to 10 and 14 tomorrow. You know, so having a little bit of data tracking is never a bad thing to be able to reflect back on. So you're going to decide your why. You're going to decide your what. You're going to decide your when. So this should all go smooth sailing, right? Well, you know, stuff happens. Life happens. There's going to be birthday parties. There's going to be different things. So my advice is to be flexible and just do the best you can. And on that note, have very realistic expectations of what you expect. You know, this is 29 days. Y'all say it again. Rome wasn't built in a day. If you're looking to lose 45 pounds, it ain't happening in these 29 days. Or if it does, it wasn't because of intermittent fasting, because we know if it's fast, it doesn't last, and slow is the way to go. So let's kind of focus on some NSVs, also called non-scale victories, that we can celebrate at the end of these 29 days. And the one that I hope we're all celebrating is consistency. I hope on the last day of February, we are all so proud of ourselves because we did this consistently for 29 days. That is an NSV. That is a victory that is to be celebrated. And there's other things that I know during our last time we did a fasting challenge with the Coach Kathy group that a lot of you noticed were things like increased energy, decreased pain, because fasting by default is anti-inflammatory, and a lot of people who suffer from chronic pain get great results while they're fasting increased quality of sleep, decreased cravings and sugar cravings specifically, and an increase in good and healthy habits. Those are all really big wins, guys. And it's not all about the scale. The scale is sometimes the last measure of success that we should be looking for. Even if weight loss is your goal, you need to celebrate non-scale victories. So another thing I want you to do, just a little tip, is when you do open your eating window, make it count, make good choices, do the best you can, and you know I'm always going to encourage a protein-based diet. I'm not saying eat all protein, I'm not saying go full-blown carnivore, but I am saying you should be getting at least half to one gram of body weight of protein. And, you know, we can mess around with those numbers later. But really, if you're a woman, you should be shooting for a minimum of 90 grams of protein a day, regardless of what your weight is. Like, that's like bare bones minimum. Because we know protein sustains. Protein helps the encourage of mTOR and building muscle. And, you know, protein rarely elicits an, an insulin response. I mean, it can and it does. But it's, it's not going to do it like the Snickers is going to. And it's just going to fuel you and sustain you and, you know... It's just not something that's super easy to overeat on. It's very satiating. You know, I can eat chicken and then be like, okay, I don't want any more chicken. I never have that feeling with potato chips. You know, you can eat and eat and eat and it's, you know, they told us themselves, nobody can eat just one. So, you know, this is why what you eat when you're fasting matters and healthy fat matters too. And again, this is going to sustain you. And so it's really your supper that I want you to super focus on and, and have that be fueled with a great protein source and some healthy fats because fat and protein keep you fullest longest. So this is what's gonna sustain you into the next morning. This is what's gonna help you wake up and not be wanting to eat your pillow. <laughs> you know, this is what's going to make it very doable to go until nine in the morning, 10 in the morning, 11 in the morning, or maybe you're gonna fast from 12 noon until 8 p.m. You know, everybody's is different. But uh, having a quality supper the night before is going to help you. And on that note, I encourage you to eat dessert. And I'm not talking about a sugar-filled dessert because that's just going to work against you and you're going to be hungry probably before you even go to bed. But I'm talking some of those protein um, 
puddings that I've been making on my YouTube channel or the Greek yogurt bar. Having something, and I'm just saying this as a woman, you know, I'm sure guys have these cravings too, but having something a little sweet after your meat or your meat and salt and whatever you had for supper, it just kind of makes you feel done for the night. And so sometimes it's like, we'll eat supper and then we're like, oh, and I'll have dessert later. And you kind of wait around to have that. And I never encourage you to eat if you're not hungry. If you're completely satisfied after you've had your supper and you don't need that little something extra, that is fine. You should close your eating window then and begin your fast. But if you're like me and you like to have something, you know, maybe wait 10 or 15 minutes and have a little something more, that, when I do that, I don't feel tempted to eat the rest of the night. I really feel satisfied. I feel content. I feel like I've hit all of my flavor and texture things. I've got my salty. I've got my sweet. I've got my crunchy. I've got my creamy. You know, I hit all those during my supper and the little bit of dessert after. Usually it's Greek yogurt bark is what I'm having. And by doing that, I'm satisfied for the rest of the night. I close my window. I go brush my teeth. Sometimes I will have a cup of tea unsweetened after, and that's totally okay. Or I'll just have a little bit more water before bed. But, you know, really having something excellent for supper helps you sustain through the rest of the night. And so it's not going to be waiting in the morning that most people struggle with. It's the getting rid of the night snacking. We are so conditioned to calming ourselves with food, or sometimes we're just bored, or sometimes we're anxious. And so it's that nighttime snacking that usually we're reaching for comfort and it's not actually hunger. Because remember, if you are eating when you're not hungry, you are overeating. And so that's something that we absolutely need to work on with our weight loss and weight maintenance efforts. So some tips for that is just to go to bed earlier. We know the more sleep we get, the more it helps us on this journey, the more belly fat we're going to burn while we're sleeping. It's going to drop our cortisol levels down and we're going to wake up more refreshed. This is when healing happens. This is when the most human growth hormone production happens. You know, very, very good things happen during our sleep. And the more REM sleep, that deep sleep, that rapid eye movement sleep that we get, all encourages this too. So going to bed earlier helps. Brushing your teeth helps. Like I said, some tea helps. And, and stay distracted. Okay, so I want you to be encouraged because after 29 days, if you do this, there's all kinds of great things that can potentially happen for you. Like we've talked about weight loss, but you're going to be burning your own fat for fuel. And I guess that's why the starvation mode myth really drives me crazy because unless you're like 10% body fat, and if you are, you're probably not fasting and you're probably not listening to this podcast, but... um. When we're accessing our own body stored fat for fuel, we're still eating. We're just eating ourselves instead of physically eating food. And if you have a substantial amount of weight to lose, or if you want to lose some body fat, that's a very good thing. So just because you don't have food coming in down your esophagus, it doesn't mean that you're not getting nutrients and sustenance because we have all kinds of calories and all kinds of vitamins and minerals in our own stored fat. So Burning fat for fuel absolutely is an excellent side effect to intermittent fasting. And I love the increased brain health. Um, a lot of med students will practice even extended fasting when they have like their big exams because the mental clarity that happens with fasting is amazing. And I know when my husband was training to be a captain, he implemented intermittent fasting because he just felt so sharp and, and in tune and everything just seemed like acutely better mentally. And on that note, too, we know from a recent study through the New England Journal of Medicine in 2019, they had a huge meta-analysis of like over 85 different studies about intermittent fasting, and it was awesome. And it drives me crazy that this didn't get more attention from the media because it seems like because there's no money to be made off of intermittent fasting, you know, Big Pharma's not profiting off of this, and all of these diet companies and ad generators and big food, big food is just as big as big pharma. Nobody's making money off of you when you fast. And so this just kind of got hush hush. It's like, oh, by the way, we noticed that, you know, there was an, a huge benefit to people that had neurogenerative disorders. You know, I have multiple sclerosis. I should know that as an MS patient. And we know that they're even calling Alzheimer's disease, which affects women way more than men. I mean, men do still get it, but women are more likely to be diagnosed. They're calling it type 3 diabetes. So it's a direct result of an insulin resistance slash diabetes problem. It's so frustrating that something as simple as withholding your breakfast for a little bit and cutting out your evening eating a little bit could really help in this area. And that's what this meta-analysis found. 
And, you know, it showed, they actually went so far as to say that fasting should be the first line of defense for neurodegenerative disorders and diseases, cardiovascular disease, obesity, diabetes, even wound healing guys, GI problems, and cancer. So again, I'm not a doctor. I'm just telling you what all these other doctors from these 85 studies, when they did the big meta-analysis, this is what they determined after reviewing all of that peer-reviewed, science-based, evidence-based, factual data. That matters. That's important, and that's exactly why I want to encourage all of you to just give this a try. So Hippocrates is the father of medicine as we know it, and even he said, take away food and the body will heal. That's pretty profound, and so that's the takeaway for today. Take away the food and the body will heal. You know, he's not saying forever, and you know, I'm not telling you to go on a four-month fast with never eating anything. Be reasonable, guys. Don't be coming at me in the comments section with crazy talk like that. This is just intermittent fasting. I'm encouraging you to set parameters daily of when you are going to eat and when you're not going to eat. And I want to come back after 29 days and see how you all did. Um, I was going back through my notes of the last 30-day challenge and we had people lose 18 pounds, 12 pounds, 10 pounds. Many, many, many people lost eight pounds and six pounds. Those kind of seem to be like the two biggest. Some people lost two pounds. Some people didn't lose any pounds, but they noticed that they lost inches and they were able to wear pants that they couldn't wear before. Some people had amazing glucose readings for the first time in a very, very, very long time. Some people were able to decrease their amount of de metformin that they were on at the time. Um, you know, diabetics in the group, and again, get this cleared with your doctor first if you are a diabetic. If, even if you're not, I'm just telling you what has happened in the past. And I'm never going to uh, supersede any of your medical professionals. And I'm not a medical professional. And nothing I'm saying here is medical advice. But I just want you to know when other people have done intermittent fasting, they've had really good blood glucose results. And so we know when our glucose is controlled, our insulin is controlled. And we control the insulin, we control the weight, we control the potential for obesity-related diseases and insulin-related diseases. So very, very good things can happen in the next 29 days. I'm excited. I'm going to be doing this right along with you like I always do. I'm here for any help that you have. Let me know in the comments section if you have any questions. If, I, if there was something I missed to cover, please let me know. And I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad that you're on this journey with me for uh, weight maintenance for me and weight loss for you if that's you and weight maintenance if that's you. But we've got a lot of work to do. So let's get started and let's get fasting during February.